Hey guys, Chastity and Greg here, back to break down another episode of Star Trek Discovery, this time with Season 3, Episode 6, Scavengers. Of course, warning, spoilers ahead. If you haven't seen this episode yet, get out of here, go watch it, and then come on back here. Now let's break it down. This episode kicks off with Discovery finally getting their 32nd century retrofit. The original Crossfield class ship will now bear the registry NCC 1031A. Now, fun fact here is Brian Fuller is a big fan of Halloween, it's his favorite holiday, so of course that's why the ship has the registry 1031. Now, the day before Halloween happens to be Devil's Night, and 1030 was the registry of the other ship, the sister ship to Discovery, the USS Glenn, which we saw back in season one, which had a terrible misfortune, almost like a horror show itself, uh, on the ship when they tried to do their spore drive jumps. Very scary stuff. So internal systems have been updated and programmable matter has been integrated into the ship. The nacelles are now also detached from the ship, as we saw in the last episode with many of the Federation ships, including the USS Voyager J. And speaking of the Voyager J, uh, CBS gave us a little bit more on the ship. They released a few photos uh, of the USS Nog and the Voyager J, where you can see how the nacelles are detached. The Disco crew is adapting to the 32nd century and are ready to work with Admiral Vance and the Federation on new missions. The planet Argeth is on yellow alert. The Emerald Chain, which is the syndicate of Andorians and Orions, is making a move on the planet for unknown reasons. Vance wants Discovery to be ready to jump in case things get out of control. I love the roll call situation with the Admiral where he's just telling everyone, okay, here you go, this is your job, this is your job, and uh, of course now everyone's coming up to speed with the fact that Discovery is a very, very special ship at the moment, yeah. and they're the only ones that can really go off and to do these like far off missions. The other captains just learned about the spore drive basically, and he's like, that information doesn't leave this room. Um, but okay. yeah, so they uh, have access to it, but they're still pretty much figuring out what they can do with that. But now they're kind of a last resort ship to make a jump yeah. anywhere. So they gotta stay at home base, which makes sense. Next, the Discovery crew gets their new comm badges. To save space, the holopads are integrated into the badge and projected. The badges also function as tricorders, communicators, and transporters. The consoles have been retrofitted with programmable matter that reads their bio signs. Everyone's really excited about the future tech and Detmer's kind of wary about it, but Bryce is like all for it. Do we really need all of this? Oh yeah, we do. Now, while everyone's playing with the programmable matter, moments later, the crew is hailed by a queen. <laughs> grudge. It's Grudge. It's, it's grudge, grudge the Cat. It seems Booker overheard someone talking about a black box on his way to a Bajoran exchange, and he sent his ship to find Discovery should he not return in 24 hours. It turns out it's been three weeks since he made that message to Burnham. So apparently the black box can tell a ship's last moments right before the burn. Now, Michael discovered that apparently the explosions didn't happen all at the same time during the burn, so Michael thinks she can collect all the data from these black boxes and find the point of origin. Burnham wants to jump to Hunhow, but they can't go while they're on a call for a possible jump to Argeth. So of course, Burnham, who has learned nothing since season one, <laughs> uh, immediately turns around, finds Giorgio, and goes on a secret, unsanctioned mission to go find Booker and the Black Box. Classic. Are you in or out? Giorgio? You hadn't yet on sanctioned mission. The two take Book's ship to Hunhow, and Jojo has questions about Michael and Booker's relationship. Before she can poke Burnham anymore, Jojo has some quick, erratic flashes to the past. We see her hands covered in blood from a fallen Terran officer in a mask. We see a shot of the ISS Charon, which housed the palace of the Terran Emperor Jojo. We also see a facility located on a hill in an unknown location. And she screams out, Son! Moments later, they arrive at the planet and are told to turn back around by an Orion security officer, Tolar. And Giorgio manages to take care of the situation by telling him that she's looking to deal her dilithium, and she bullies her way onto the planet. Burnham reverse engineered Book's cat collar so she can find him on the planet. Back on Discovery, Tilly isn't thrilled to find Grudge on her bed and finds out that Burnham and Book's ship is no longer on the Discovery. Now back on the planet, we discover that the Orion, uh, Tolar, he's Osira's nephew. The planet they're on, Hunhao, is an exchange like factory dump where Osira makes people work off their debts. At a melting forge, we see an Andorian named Ren placing security implants on new arrivals. We quickly learn that everyone hates him at the moment. Now things quickly escalate the moment Burnham shows up and locks eyes with Book. After a worker tries to hide water rations, Tolar uses the opportunity to test out the new system update on the perimeter pylons. Turns out they work. 
Back on the Discovery, Grey wants to explore the ship, but Adira just wants to stick to her duties. Meanwhile, Stamus is upset the engine room is a mess and they could jump to Argith at any moment. And meanwhile, Linus is still having problems with his new badge. And from there, Adira introduces Stamets to the new spore drive system that runs on nanogel. Back on Hunhao, Book tells Michael he found the black box and hid it in his quarters, and that she should leave him on the planet. He doesn't want her to end up like Ren. Ren tried to lead a revolt, but Osira cut off his antenna and made him the one to install the security chips on everyone. Burnham assures him that she has a plan. Meanwhile in engineering, Saru talks to Tilly about uh, their little Burnham situation, where Michael has disappeared from the ship, and Tilly tells him straight up that you need to talk to the Admiral about this so none of us yeah. get burned by this whole situation, and she's right. They're both right. Like, Saru was looking for a reason to think otherwise and was hoping that Tilly could talk him down, but no, they're doing the right thing. They really need to prove themselves. Back with Giorgio and Burnham, they take down the drone that's been keeping an eye on them, which sets off an alarm. Book cues Rin the Andorian to gather the other workers for a breakout. Giorgio only has time to build one weapon with what they've gathered. Their plan is to get the perimeter controls. From there, Rin gives the black box to Book, who tells him that they're going to get out of there on a transport ship. And back at Federation HQ, Saru reports to Vance and Willa about Burnham's disappearance and error in judgment. Yeah, Vance definitely has bigger fish to fry than Burnham right now, so he tells Saru to stand by, get ready to jump, because the Emerald Chain does not want to talk right now, so diplomacy isn't working. Back on Hunhao, Tolar handcuffs Giorgio and Burnham and takes them back to Book's ship, where they find the Dilithium. Meanwhile, Book rallies the other workers to make a run for it. Seeing the chaos unfold from the ship, two of Tolar's henchmen leave to look into it, leaving Giorgio and Burnham in a two-on-two -two fight while Book and crew wait for the two of them to turn the perimeter fences off. Giorgio is about to shoot Tolar, but is hit with visions again and freezes up at the worst possible moment. This time, the visions include blood on a hand, Emperor Giorgio in her Terran uniform as a hologram, Burnham from behind in the Terran universe walking past Starfleet officers, more of the bloody hand, and the murder weapon. So this time it's real bad, Giorgio falls to the ground, she's immobilized, Burnham's telling her to get the controller. What do you make of these visions? What did Cronenberg do to her? Uh, <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Uh, is this character uh, also Terran? Is he, uh, did he do something to her mind? Or are these visions just stuff that's happening to her because of their trip uh, through the wormhole? Uh, we don't know just yet, but I'm sure we're gonna have to circle back around uh, to uh, Cronenberg. And I know his name's not Cronenberg, it's Kovich, but we're gonna call him Cronenberg from here on out. <laughs> when Giorgio finally comes to, she knocks down Tolar and steals the controller, but he teleports away. She turns the perimeter wall off and the workers make their run for it to the transport ship. Unfortunately, a henchman shoots at Book, but Rin blocks the shot with his own body. As the workers run from the armed guards, Burnham and Giorgio show up in Book's ship and start firing at the guards. Book and Rin teleport onto the ship, and as they leave, Giorgio destroys the entire salvaging facility. And Book gives the black box to Burnham. And from there, Burnham confronts Giorgio on the ship because of her tremors or whatever's happening to her, and this is where Giorgio tells her that it's been happening to her for a few weeks now. Michael says she's not alone, but Giorgio replies that another Michael Burnham also told her to trust her, but we know how that ended. So for context, in the Mirror Universe, Giorgio adopted that version of Burnham after she was orphaned. And then later, Michael turned on her and sided with Gabriel Lorca, and Emperor Giorgio issued a death penalty on her. Back on Discovery, Stamets is curious and asks Adira why she's talking to herself. Adira comes clean and tells him the truth about Grey, to which Stamets replies that it sounds like Adira is holding on to a loved one, and that he did that when Hugh was gone. Stamets tells Adira he believes that Grey is still with her. He also expresses how impressive she is and that she can accomplish things he can't even imagine. Adira says she can help Stamets with his arms. So Burnham goes to sickbay and sees that Rin is going to survive, and then as she's about to meet the firing squad, um, mm -hmm. she, she and Book talk and have a heart to heart in the turbo lift. And before they have a nice yep. moment, they get interrupted by the third instance of Linus's joke. This is not the science lab. <laughs> Man, these new badges. Later on, Vance tells Saru that Bernal's mission was 100% rogue, but an unexpected opportunity. And if asked, he may have deemed the intel worth the risk. And Michael admits she disobeyed a direct order and undermined Saru and Vance's authority. I think Vance is being super lenient, and he said that the only reason that she's not in the brig is because she saved lives. Still super lenient, and like to leave the punishment to Saru. I, I know he's got a lot to deal with and doesn't want to really deal with this, but like he... Yeah. He even said, he's like, you should have just come to me about this. I might have said it would be fine. Like, 
the intel it's, here is important. Like, they really should have. Yeah. Kirk did this, but he was the captain at the time, and he went over Admiral's heads in the movies. Yeah, but again, same thing. You save lives, so we're just going to let it go at the end of the day. <laughs> Burnham says she's been searching for the source of the burn for a year, and they must solve the mystery of how and why it happened. Now, this is subjective. This is where fans who want to know more about the burn, they're going to side with Michael here, and fans like me and you, Chastity, <laughs> who don't care about the burn and would love to know more about like the Baryon sweep and like an episode where Tilly and Stamets are are trapped on the ship, just like in the old TNG episode yeah, in the Baryon sweep. We want to know that. Yeah, obviously, yes, they, they could pull information from the black box to help them solve these mysteries, but I would rather it would be like a B plot and like the A plot mm -hmm. be something way more interesting and just moving forward with exploring and dealing with whatever is going on on that planet they were supposed to go to. <laughs> now Vance leaves Burnham's punishment up to Saru. Saru tells Michael he agrees with her intentions, but it comes down to trust. He was hoping that things would return to the way they were when she agreed to be his number one, but that just didn't happen. Obviously, Saru leaves her of duty as his number one, and she will restrict herself to chief science officer duties only. Michael tells him he's doing the right thing. Saru promises that they will find the answers that they're looking for. Who's the new number one? Tilly, right? right? I guess? Is it Tilly? They're, Linus? They're really like teeing it up for it to be Tilly because Saru and Tilly have been so close this season, but mm -hmm. she's an ensign. It, like, it wouldn't everyone else be really angry? <laughs> well, whenever he relieves the bridge, he, he leaves it to Nielsen, but we've barely seen Nielsen at all um, in terms of screen time and character development. So this could be an opportunity to learn more about Nielsen if Nielsen's next in line, but also, I feel like there's going to be just some kind of wedge where he does want it to be Tilly and the rest of the entire bridge crew is pissed because they outrank her. All right, now on to things we noticed and Easter eggs. First, we see a bunch of location names listed in front of Vance in his first shot this episode. Among them we spotted Talos, which is a reference to the Talos system, Starbase 47, which is another reference to 47 this season, Hulka, which might be the Hulk in Homeworld, Benicia, which is a planet first reference in the original series episodes The Conscious of the King and Turnabout Intruder, Camus, which is a star system not far from Benicia, the planet Camus 2 was first mentioned in TOS, and Beta Niobe, a star that went supernova in TOS but was retconned in Undiscovered Country and seen in star charts in TNG. NG and DS9. I was on my way to the Bajoran exchange when this guy sitting next to me started talking about a black box. Now the Bajorans were a species first mentioned in TNG, distinguished by their horizontal creases across their noses. Ro Laren was Bajoran. Gray mentions to Adira that there are activities like fencing on the ship now. Hikaru Sulu and Jean-Luc Picard were fencers, and fencing was frequently shown on TNG. Tritanium power coils are offered to Giorgio for purchase. This is relevant because in the season 3 premiere, Book says that there hasn't been anything like the Tritanium alloy in the Red Angel suit in years. In Star Star Trek, tritanium alloy is a widely used construction material. 24th century Federation starships had tritanium bulkheads. Saru says, I will be honest, Ensign. I have not felt this mistrusting of her since we served on the Shenzhou. This calls back to the very beginning of Star Trek Discovery. Burnham was stripped of rank as first officer and imprisoned for mutiny after taking command of the Shenzhou and preparing to attack the Klingons by firing on them first. Vance says, I'll Make sure they clear the ship before doing the Baryon sweep. You may recall the Baryon sweep from the TNG episode Starship Mine. It's a procedure that eliminates Baryon particles from a ship. They accumulate as a side effect of warp travel and need to be removed to prevent radiation buildup. And as we saw in Starship Mine, the sweep is deadly to organic matter. All right, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss our next breakdown for episode seven. Uh, let us know what you thought of this episode in the comment section down below, and we'll be back here next week. Bye-bye.